part-time instructor in the Peace Studies program. He's an advisor to the Peace Studies program, and I think as part of that, he's become deeply involved in the Unoccupy Albuquerque movement. We don't like to say the word leader, but he is uh, spending a lot of time, again, a lot of effort and sacrificing himself and helping us organize these teach-ins. So we are very grateful to Desi Brown. He is a grad student in American Studies. He does policy analysis for the state senator, Jerry Ortiz Ipino. He has a nonprofit swing dancing group that's been dancing for 15 years. And now we rec uh, welcome Desi. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Jenny Moore, for, for coming out and talking. It's, it's always a really great thing to have you here. Um, a couple of things I wanted to touch on. Uh, number one was the first question that dealt with uh, you know, what, what can be done kind of legally to control corporations and things like that and, and the money that's in politics. And uh, I can't remember if it's Senator Jeff Bigaman or Tom Udall, but one of the two of them is, has introduced a constitutional amendment. Um, it was Udall? Okay, so, so we have a New Mexico senator who is actively working on that, and there's no reason at all that uh, every, every person in New Mexico doesn't get behind that in a, in a big way, because it's a really important thing that, that, that needs to occur. Um, and I also wanted to build on one of the things that, that Professor Moore talked about, um, the idea of, of international law being weak yet strong. I think there's a weakness and a strength to what's going on with the Occupy Wall Street movement and the Unoccupy Albuquerque movement. You know, everybody's questioning what are the specifics, the specific demands and things like that. Um, and there are a number of them, and they're being flushed out as we speak. It's really important to remember that this movement is only eight weeks old, and uh, the civil rights movement took nine years. Uh, the women's rights movement took decades. Uh, you know, so, so it takes a while to flush out the details of this kind of stuff. Um, but what's important, and this is something that a couple people have talked about yesterday, is that this is a moral movement. It's an issue about morals. Um, and we need to keep hammering that home. We don't have to have a specific message. We can talk about holding people morally accountable, um, publicly, politically, in our academic institutions, and things like that. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to switch this mic. Because the sound was really crappy. So there you go. So um, what I was going to talk about quickly is the idea of speaking truth to power. Um, and a little bit of a sort of the history of what's going on for those who aren't familiar with what's been happening on campus for the past several weeks, and also kind of maybe where we can go to with it. Um, first off, I, I teach a class, Intro to Peace Studies, here on campus. Um, I'm in my second year of teaching that. And we talk about social justice issues, environmental justice issues, and things like that at all levels, the global level, the national level the local level and right here on campus. There are things that happen right here on campus every day. We also talk about solutions to those problems. Um, and what I try to encourage all of my students to do in, in this class is make them recognize that each and every one of them is capable of making a difference. Um, one of the things that's happened, I think, in, in our education system and maybe more generally in our culture, the, in the US culture, is that nobody thinks that they can make a difference anymore. And hence, everybody just kind of sits on the sidelines and watches corporations with lots of money take power. They take over. They're suddenly the ones who are making the laws instead of us. And and what I try to encourage my students to do is make sure that they recognize that they have the same ability. And I try to give them the tools to work with to do so. Um, in the class that I teach, I try to talk about mediation, conflict resolution, nonviolent communication techniques, restorative justice techniques, all kinds of ways that that we can engage with folks who who might have a different opinion than us. All kinds of ways that we can talk to them and problem solve in a whole bunch of different ways. And to me, one of the things that was most disappointing with, with what's happened between the administration and, and the Unoccupy Albuquerque movement is that I recognize that the administration doesn't know any of those things. Or if they do, they've willfully chosen to ignore them. Um, so we'll get into that in a second. Here at UNM, uh, not just my class, but 
dozens of classes, maybe even a hundred classes on this campus, focus on issues like mediation, conf um, conflict resolution, corporate ethics, uh, responsible governance. Uh, we have we have classes in virtually every program on this campus that do really good work and teach really awesome things about how to do the right thing in the world, how to be moral, how to be just. And we have hundreds if not thousands of students who have learned these techniques and yet our administration has chosen to ignore those things. Uh, a week ago, after, after the many arrests and things that happened, we started this series called Teachable Moments by President Schmidley. Um, so I wanna, I wanna just give a little history on what happened in the last couple, three weeks, or, or actually even before that. Uh, when the when the unoccupy Albuquerque movement first chose to reside on campus, everybody wondered why. Well, it's a public space, for one. Uh, city parks are public spaces as well. The reason many of the members wanted to be here on campus is because the Albuquerque Police Department has a history of shooting people and killing them outside on the streets. UNM is a safe space. It's a place where they felt that they could reside and, and build a movement without fear of interruption and without fear of being shot or being harassed. APD also has a history of violently reacting to protests um, in recent years, as well as decades past. As a result of that, they met on campus over on the, north, on the south, southwest corner and there was an immediate concern from the administration uh, about people being on campus. We heard that there were going to be evictions, so a number of faculty members and students chose to write a letter to President Schmidley asking that they simply engage in dialogue with that group before they kick them off campus. We had a dialogue, we had a great meeting, um, lasted for several hours, had a dozen people in it, people from the administration, people from the Peace Studies program. Interestingly, nobody from the unoccupied movement because they weren't invited uh, by the administration. That meeting was, was a wonderful one where the administration expressed their concerns, made some suggestions, suggested that there could be teachable moments from all this thing if only the occupiers would go away. The goal was to address the issue on campus and get rid of the, camp, get rid of the protest. That was the goal. Um, we took that information to the protesters. They addressed it, the, the concerns of the location. They willfully moved to a different location, a location that has a lot of historical significance, Yale Park. It's been the site of protests for decades. Um, and uh, we thought everything was good. Pro, uh, permits were reapplied for, requests were made. The university seemed to be in agreement and seemed to be willing to work with the group. And then, without warning, 19 minutes after their, pro after their permit was supposed to go into effect, the protesters were evicted on a Sunday night at 12.20 a.m. with police dogs, with state riot police, with the UNM Police Department present. Um, no warning, no, no explanation. In fact, the police didn't even know that a permit had been applied for. The protesters didn't even know that the permit had been denied. Uh, a clear lack of communication that came directly from the administration. And this is a really important thing to understand. I think it's really important to understand the history of things like that so that we can act upon that history. Uh, a, a consequence of that eviction, which occurred at 12.20 a.m. on a Sunday night, was to try to have a meeting immediately following that. We tried to have that meeting, and the administration refused to meet with anybody. They refused for over a day. They finally agreed to have a meeting. We showed up for the meeting and the president's office was locked. The president's office was locked for nine and a half hours that day after they had promised to have a meeting with unoccupied Albuquerque members and, and as well as uh, faculty members who'd agreed to kind of mediate uh, the situation. That would be a teachable moment. That would be a teachable moment where it shows that, that dialogue wasn't going to occur, that those in power weren't willing to speak on an equal level. Uh, they were willing to speak via press releases and very carefully orchestrated meetings where only the right people were invited and the right things were said, but they weren't willing to actually engage in deep dialogue in the, in the situation. The second eviction occurred with 37 arrests. That would be on a Tuesday night. 37 people were arrested for simply trying to claim space, trying to claim public space. Does anybody know the fact that there's not a place in Albuquerque 
nor in most of the country where you can protest 24 hours a day. You have to have a permit. You have to fill out multiple permits. You have to do all kinds of things in order to simply protest beyond a certain set of hours. Does that not seem strange to folks? I think so. Um, to me, the most glaring, and it's a singular example, but the most glaring example of how poorly the administration has actually helped dealt with this situation on campus is the arrest on the following day of a single student. A single student who was sitting at a park bench and reading a book. Literally. Sitting at a park bench and reading a book. And he was arrested for trying to claim a space. Trying to hang out, watch, see what was going on. And he was arrested. He spent 14 hours in jail. I went to his hearing yesterday at uh, the Metro Court Office where he faces the risk of 364 days in jail and a thousand dollar fine for sitting at a park bench on campus and reading a book. Think about that. Something to think about. Um, outside of UNM, People were wondering, what's the big deal on college campuses? And what's the deal in city parks and stuff like that? Why is it that Occupy Wall Street has become identified in the past couple of weeks with, resist with resistance to the police? It's because those in power are fearful. Police are involved in actions all over this country. There have been, as of last night, there have been 2,500 plus arrests in the United States alone in the past eight weeks since the Occupy Wall Street movement has started. Arrests of people who've been, for the most part, entirely peaceful, for the most part, simply talking about the issues, talking about poverty, talking about homelessness, talking about healthcare issues, talking about all kinds of things that need to be fixed. Yet there have been 2,500 people arrested for that, for publicly talking about that. Interesting. Yesterday, on the UC Berkeley campus, yesterday, 24 hours ago, student protesters who were protesting rises in their tuition fees because the administration had chosen to spend millions of dollars in their tuition on upgrading a, an athletic facility on campus were met with tear gas and police at UC Berkeley yesterday. Just yesterday. It's going on all over the place. Harvard University, two days ago, might have been last night, kind of, sort of, but Harvard University also met with police as they protested the corporate structure of their university. This is happening in town after town after town, in college after college after college, all over the country right now. It's really important for people to recognize that what's going on on this campus is not isolated. And it's really important that people get involved in these kinds of issues. Um, it was mentioned a week ago or so that there were complaints that this protest was costing the university money. It cost $25,000 in overtime, both for university police and APD and state police officers. The answer to that is, if the university had simply engaged in, in conversation with the protesters, with faculty members, with students who were actually trying to help mediate the situation, if they'd engaged in conversation for maybe a couple of hours to talk about the differences of a permit, that maybe all those expenses wouldn't have been incurred. Those expenses rest directly with the administration's office. I think the last thing that I wanted to say, and is Mark here yet? Yes. Excellent. The last thing that I wanted to say is just touch on the idea that not just Harvard, where they were protesting and met with police officers a couple days ago, but most universities in this country have adopted an increasingly corporate structure. Uh, they've gotten away from actually educating people and they've gotten into the business of educating people. And UNM, maybe it's not as bad as some, but it certainly is pretty bad. And I think that the Occupy Wall Street movement and the Unoccupy Albuquerque movement is directly relevant in terms of ensuring that the university or that the students and the faculty of this university do a really good job to try to minimize the impacts of that and maybe even turn the course so that instead of accepting 
every dollar that's offered to the university for research, for, for medical research, for engineering re for research. Maybe look at who it is that's giving us the money. Maybe look at the kinds of research that's being done. Are we doing things that actually solve social, social justice issues in this country? Or are we doing things that actually create worse ones? Um, I think that, again, as students and as faculty members and as community members, we need to hold the university accountable for such actions and and not to be afraid to go and knock on President Schmidley's door when it's locked. And that's all I want to say.